Okay, so we're here. We're at the inn. Tolson's inn. Welcome. The council has told me about you. Please enjoy your stay. As Kai oh, well, slips into deep sleep, his dream unfolds. A dream or his past. At this moment, there is no way he could know. Hammer calls him is like deep into his heart. <clears throat> a dream has been revealed. Let's dream it. I think this is a lot of reading, so it'll be fun. <coughs> the family members have tears in their eyes when Welcome came back to the inn for his long journey. Thank you so much for coming. He understands the situation immediately. Time for departure is drawing near. Hannah's departure. Too soon, too soon. But still, he knows. This day would have come sometime and not in the distant future. I might never see you again, she said to him with a sad smile when he left his journey. Her smiling face, almost transparent, its whiteness, so fragile and therefore indescribably beautiful. So she lay in the bed. <coughs> May I see Hannah now, he asks. The innkeeper gives him a tiny nod and says, I don't think she knows who you are, though. She hasn't opened her eyes since last night, he warns Kaim. You can tell her from the slight movement in the chest that she's clinging to a frail third of life. But it could snap at any moment. It's such a shame. I know you made a special point to come here for her. Another tear glides down the wife's cheek. <laughs> Never mind. It's fine, Kaim says. He's been present in innumerable deaths, and experience has taught him much. Death takes away the power of speech, first of all, then the ability to see. What remains alive to the very end, however, is the power to hear. Even though the person has lost consciousness, it is by no means unusual for the voices of the family to bring forth smiles or tears. Kaim puts his arm around the woman's shoulder and says, I have lots of travel stories to tell her. I'm looking forward to this my whole time on the road. Instead of smiling, the woman releases another large tear and nods to Kaim. And Hannah was so looking forward to hearing your stories. Her sobs almost drowned out her words. The innkeeper says, I wish I could urge you to rest up from your travels before, but you see her, but time interrupts his apologies. Of course, I'll see you right away. There's very little time left. Hannah, the only daughter of the innkeeper and his wife, will probably breathe her last breath before the sun comes up. Kaim lowers his pack to the floor and quietly opens the door to Hannah's room. Hannah was frail from birth. Far from enjoying the opportunity to travel, she rarely left the town or even the neighborhood in which she was born and raised. This child will probably not live to adulthood, the doctor told the parents. To this tiny girl with extraordinary, beautiful, doll-like features, the gods had dealt an all-too-sad destiny. They had allowed her to be born the only daughter of the keepers of a small inn by the highway. It was perhaps one small act of atonement for such inequity. Hannah was unable to go anywhere, but the guests who stayed at the parents' inn would tell her stories of the countries and towns and landscapes and people that she would never know. 
Whenever new guests arrived at the inn, Hannah would ask them, Where are you from? Where are you going? Can you tell me a story? She would sit and listen to their stories with sparkling eyes, urging them on to new episodes with, And then? And then? When they left the inn, she would beg them, Please come back and tell me lots and lots of stories about faraway countries. She would stand there waving until the person disappeared far down the highway. Give only one one only sigh and go back to bed. <laughs> Hannah is sound asleep. No one else is in the room, and perhaps an indication that she has since long past the stage when the doctors can do anything for her. Kaim sits down in the chair next to the bed and says with a smile, Hello Hannah, I'm back. She does not respond. Her little chest, still without the swelling of a grown woman, rises and falls almost imperceptibly. I went far across the ocean this time, he tells her. The ocean on the side where the sun comes up. I took a boat from the harbor way, way, way far beyond the mountains you can see from this window. And I was on the sea from the time the moon was perfectly round till it got smaller and smaller and then bigger and bigger until it was full again. There was nothing but ocean as far as the eye could see. Just the sea and the sky. Can you imagine it, Hannah? You've never seen the ocean, but I'm sure people have told you about it. It's like a huge, big, endless puddle. Kaim chuckles to himself, and it seems to him that Hannah's pale white cheek moves slightly. She can hear him. Even if she cannot speak or see, her ears are still alive. Believing and hoping this to be true, Kaim continues the story of his travels. He speaks no words of parting. He, always, as always with Hannah, Kaim smiles with a special gentleness, gentleness he has never shown to anyone else. And he goes on, telling his tales with a bright voice, sometimes even accompanying his story with exaggerated gestures. He tells her about the blue ocean, he tells her about the blue sky. He says nothing about the violent sea battle that stained the ocean red. He never tells her about those things. Hannah was still a tiny girl when Kaim first visited the inn. When she asked him, where are you from, and will you tell me some stories? With a childless pronunciation and innocent smile, Kaim felt a soft glow in his chest. At the time, he was returning from battle. Most, more precisely, he had ended one battle and was on his way to the next. His life consisted of traveling from one battlefield to another, and nothing about that has changed to this day. He has taken the lives of countless enemy troops and witnessed the death of countless comrades on the battlefield. Moreover, the only thing separating enemies from comrades is the slightest stroke of fortune. Had the gears of destiny turned in a slightly different way, his enemies would have been comrades and his comrades' enemies. This is the fate of a mercenary. He was spiritually worn down back then and feeling unbearably lonely. As a possessor of eternal life, Kaim has no fear of death, which was precisely why each of the soldiers' faces distorted in fear, and why each face of the man who died in agony was burned permanently into his brain. Ordinarily, he would spend nights on the road drinking, immersing himself in an alcoholic stupor, or pretending to. He was trying to make himself forget the unforgettable. When, however, he saw Hannah smile as she begged him for stories about this long journey, he felt a far warmer and deeper comfort than he could ever obtain from liquor. He told her many things, about a beautiful flower he discovered on the battlefield, about a bewitching beauty of the mist falling the for filling the forest the night before the final battle, about the marvelous taste of the spring water in a ravine where he and his men had fled after a losing battle, about a vast, bottomless blue sky he saw after a battle. He never told her anything sad. He kept his mouth shut about the human ugliness and stupidity he witnessed endlessly on the battlefield. He concealed his profession position as a mercenary from her, he kept silent regarding his reasons for traveling constantly, and spoke only of things that were beautiful and sweet and lovely. He sees now that he told Hannah only beautiful stories of the road, like this not so much out of concern for her purity, but for his own sake. Staying in the inn where Hannah waited to see him turned out to be one of Kaim's small pleasures in life telling her about the memories he brought back from his journeys, he always felt some degree of salvation, however slight. Five years, ten years, his friendship with the girl continued, little by little. She entered adulthood, which meant that, as the doctors had predicted, each day brought her that much closer to death. And now, Kaim ends the last travel story he'll share with her. He can never see her again, can never tell her his stories again. Before dawn, when the darkness of light of night is at its deepest, long pauses enter into Hannah's breathing. The frail thread of her life is about to snap as Kaim and her parents watch over her. The tiny light that has lodged into Kaim's breast will be extinguished. 
His lonely travels will begin again tomorrow. His long, long travels without end. You'll be leaving on travels of your own soon, Hannah, Carm tells her gently. You'll be leaving for a world that no one knows. A world that has never entered into any of the stories you've heard so far. Finally, you'll be able to leave your bed and walk anywhere you want to go. You'll be free. He wants her to know that death is not sorrow, but a joy mixed with tears. It's your turn now. Be sure and tell everyone about the amazing of your journey. Her parents will make that same journey someday. And someday, Hannah will be able to meet all the guests she has known at the inn, far beyond the sky. I, however, can never go there. I can never escape this world. I can never see you again. This is not goodbye. It's just the start of your journey. He speaks his final words to her. We'll meet again. His final lie to her. Hannah makes her departure. Her face is transfused with a tranquil smile as if she's just said, See you soon. Her eyes will never open again. A single tear glides slowly down her cheek. So sad. Kyle's mind is filled with lost pieces of past memories. Certain sides of conversations and many years back in the form of dreams. To view episodes from a thousand years of dreams again, rest in any inner bed or select them from the start menu. You can view these episodes any number of times. When viewing an episode from a thousand years of dreams, you can pause it by pressing start or cancel it by pressing the back button. No, good. I'm good on the tutorials, thanks. I'm assuming it's gonna. will save and I have to do that again. Ba, 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 ba. Look at the group members on the right though. There's so many different group members. Did you sleep well? The message for you yet, I'm afraid. Old new messages have come for you here, so please don't hesitate to take a stroll outside. I'm sure you'd like to forget the horrors of the battlefield. Oh, by the way, feel free to use any of the items you find here. They're compliments of the house. I've already done so, sir. Whoop, sorry. Look out. Sorry, miss. Messenger for Lord Gangora. <laughs> At your service. Man, what an attitude. Jeez whiz. Uh. Searching Councilman Gangora by any chance, if you can find his personal search, so you won't find him here. If you want to see Councilman Gangora, go straight down the street and come to his estate. Don't bother if you haven't been called there. The council's a watchful eye. Oh, there's, a, there's a thing back here. Or several things back here. I guess I can't get to them. Lane. Well, I mean, you're telling me that I should go see Councilman Gangora this time. Miss this one. Wind is sealed. I'm guessing I gotta go find the other dude, but I wasn't paying attention to where he went to. Ken G, baby!
Can I take care of any shopping? Because this fucking asshole is not here still, I'm pretty sure. The Arms and Armor is the place that I would like to, I'd love to go to the Arms and Armor place, but that dude's gone. I heard about this connection of mine, the council told me Councilman McGoy has been fine his private estate. Could it be true? So the soldiers from his house aren't protecting, we'd rather keep him in there. Let's go find the council. Councilman Gorge, come to the show suspension. I believe you have your own mission to handle, yes? I do. I'm looking for... What is it that was? Wind bomb? This is where we have to go. Makes the most sense. Oh, that is. Always, always save when we get a save opportunity. sleeping. She woke up for a few minutes earlier. Lord Tolton is currently visiting. Please wait a little longer. Could have told me that before I walked in there, asshole. House arrest is going too far. I have firmly opposed Roxian on this. Do not despair, Gongora. Thank you, Your Majesty. It is much more than I could have asked. Your father would have been pleased. I could fulfill my father's shoes. And now that Ura is a republic, I am simply a citizen like everyone else. I am no longer Your Majesty. I respect the royal blood that flows in your veins. It is only fitting that I offer the respect you're due. Do not be foolish. People will think you're a dissident who wants to restore the monarchy. I'm truly happy that you have come to see me. You've always been so kind. You taught me the rudiments of magic. I cannot help but be kind to you in return. I cannot understand Roxian. I believe he intends to stop work on Grand Staff. It makes me angry, Gon our entire nation has benefited from magic energy, yet he does not understand the significance of Grand Staff. <coughs> if we can increase magic energy with Grand Staff, just think how much better our people's lives would be. Okay. We would no longer need soldiers. 
You have seen the future of Ura, and how Grand Staff can make it happen. Roxian's vision is too narrow for our nation to grow. I am sorry you had to witness that. There is no need to apologize. I'm happy your highness understands. But even if they stop Grand Staff, we could develop a newer and far better magic engine. Please let me know what you need, Gongora. I can help you. I am unworthy, your highness. He's unworthy. Please, go in. You want me to go and just, just go in? Like, you're like, ha, got him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go around. I'm gonna go shopping in the suit's house. Since the other dude's out of town. Making my way downtown, walking fast, facing. Alright, I was gonna say, are you just gonna keep me in there? This seems like this is. I feel like this place is gonna be a dungeon later on. But that seems very suspicious to me. You know, it just seems suspicious. So that, these rooms... Good to see you, Lieutenant Argonar. Lord Gungor is waiting for you. Uh, so that room seems like that's the room I'm supposed to go in. I guess. Go to ring assembly. I can do all of these. So I know things now. That's good. So is this? What's the? That's a terrible, 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 terrible. So it's over here. I feel like this is the way we want to go to explore. Items. Oh yeah. He's got shit hanging out in here. What is this? A flare bomb. Let's go. A berserker necklace. And a hawkeye. Fuck yeah, give me that. Use a leave chest out, I'm fucking taking them. Boom. you here for only one reason. 
Hold on. What is it? Oh, oh no. Great, here he comes. <gasps> hey, hey, whoa, 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 hey! Hey, you are really short-tempered. Hey, I don't have a sword, okay? Easy. Why are you here? I told you, I'm just a messenger. I, I came to see if you really come or not, which you have, so that's good. That's enough, Kaim. He's on our side. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. A little late, though. We can use him. He's cunning and quick, and he has many connections. I want you to take him on your investigation of Grand Staff. No way, sir. You know I thought he'd say that, my lord. <laughs> His shoes, hello? Look, this other immortal joining the investigation, she might be dangerous. Why? The woman was once a pirate. I don't know how it happened, but she's now a soldier for our army. Well, the past is the past, and I know little else about her. Take Jensen with you. He can help keep her in check. Despite what else he may be, he has a healthy respect for women. Ah. <sighs> so, you know, I heard she was a looker, if you catch my drift. I mean, you've seen her, right? Okay, okay, be that way. <sighs> you guys are way too serious. Hmm. Pirate. All right. Understood. All right, then. I'll be there early. Oh, yeah. You can count on it. Remember, Kaim. You're the only one I can trust. No, you're the only one I can trust. I can't leave here for a while. The Grand Staff is my life's work. So if something is wrong, I want you, with your immortal powers, to find out what it is. Understood? Man, his... You'll be brief later. Was... You should go Pure, now. like Japanese yeah. film. I'll be right behind you. Oh, he's going to be fun to work with. This is for your trouble. Wow, nice. You know, my lord, I've been thinking, uh, working with this guy, uh, it's like playing with fire. I mean, did you see his eyes? I mean, that's creepy. I got a bad feeling about this whole thing. I mean, this little guarantee is not going to be enough, I'm afraid, to keep an eye on him. You're gonna have to give me a little bit more, you know what I'm saying? Hmm. You're already under a magic contract. Don't get greedy. Whoa! Whoa, hey, okay, that's some serious mojo. <laughs> easy, easy. Is your fee still unsatisfactory? Okay, not funny. I'm not laughing, okay? I didn't stick my neck out for this, okay? Pain in the ass. Taking a bath. <laughs> Chest hurts. He's <sighs> having a bad posture the last couple days. Okay. Well, we can go out this way. Ten Argonard, do you have everything you need to your journey? You should prepare yourself well, so you may better fulfill the expectations of Lord Gengar. Have you coming in and out of here could damage Lord Gengar's reputation. The council will look kindly on it. You'll be allowed to re-enter the mansion once you leave. Are you sure you want to leave? Yeah, uh, leave. Done. Done with you guys. Alright, I'm going to take... I'm going to save it, and I'm going to take a break for a few minutes. Um, by a break, I mean... Um, you'll see the rest of this video uh, when I record it on a different day. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Yo, hello, and welcome back. I guess, I guess not really welcome back. It's just, let's continue this video. <laughs> Alright, we're gonna go back to our hotel. Our inn. Uh, or at least just start go heading back that direction. See if there's any cutscenes that can point us in a different direction. This way. I slide on him last time. <coughs> oh shit, my magma fragment. <coughs> Excuse me.
let's go to the inn. Let's see what's going on with the inn. Toll signs in. Welcome in. Please take your time to relax and rest yourselves. So I'm not supposed to stay here. Um, is there like a... That's a bummer. Can I just start going back to the gate? shit from me right now, dude. They're all like, uh oh. <clears throat> all the soldiers have been acting hostile lately. Yeah, I know. I already talked about this. <coughs> um, I guess let's go back and talk to the, the order. Oh, you're searching for Councilman Gagora. No, I don't want to see Gagora. The streets closed. I mean, I guess we can just try to leave. Back to where we came. Seems to make the most sense. Taxi would be available, but we can go back this way, I guess. No, I'm stuck. I guess we go this way. Let's see. A meteor fell in the Highlands. A meteor. Highland says that what happens when another one falls here. Uh, right, let's see. Are there any. No items. Oh, there's my healing medicine. <coughs> Mana herb. Welcome. So you need to go if you need directions or have any questions about how to use the monorail system. You also have a PA system announcements, monorail status reports, and lost and found services here. Let me know if you need anything. Oh, I'm letting you know that I need something. So it's fine. Just a shot. Excuse me, guys. Oh, throw that. oh shit! What was that? Something. Can I ring assembly? No. Nope. I think it was this cold water stone. Sorry about this. Monorail is currently out of service due to circumstances beyond our control. Where the fuck do I go then? Thank you for riding the monorail. Hope you can. Alright, here we go. <coughs> but, you know what? My dad works in a magic production factory. He's the boss of the whole place. <coughs> I'm not the boss of anything, really. I'm glad she's proud of me, though. Everything I do, I do for her. Oh, it's a memory. Uh, lots of reading and I don't have anything to drink. <coughs> a dream has been revealed. Alright, we'll dream it. 
Dreams will dream. This this whole episode is just gonna be dreams, I guess. Everyone in the marketplace hates the little girl. Not yet ten years old, and far from having outgrown the sweet innocence of childhood, she earns only open contempt from the grown-ups who have shops in the market. The reason is simple. She lies about everything. Hey, mister. I just saw a burglar go in your house. Hey, look, lady. Everything that just fell off your shelves. Hey, everybody. Did you hear what the traveler said? Bandits are planning to attack this market. Even the most harmless white lies can be annoying if repeated often enough, and the shopkeepers have found themselves growing angry. <coughs> You better watch out for her too, the lady greengrocer warns came. Kime. <laughs> Nobody here falls for her lies anymore. So she's always on the lookout for newcomers or strangers. Somebody like you would be a perfect target for her. She could be right. Kime is new to the town. He arrived a few days ago and just started working in the marketplace today. What do her parents do? Kime asks while unloading a cart full of vegetables. The woman frowns and shakes her head with a sigh. She doesn't have any. They died? The mother did, at least, maybe four or five years ago. She was a healthy young woman who never so much as caught a cold in her life, then one day she collapsed, and that was it for her. How about the father? She sighs even more deeply than before and says, he left to find a job in the city. The parents used to operate a variety store in the market, though the mother almost single-handedly took care of the actual buying and selling of the many goods they carried over. As soon as she died, the shop's fortunes took a plunge until it was eventually taken over by someone else. The father went off to the distant capital city in search of a good paying job that would enable him to cover their debts. He promised to come back in six months, but he's been gone a whole year now. Letters used to arrive him on occasion in care of his friend the tailor, but those two gave out about six months ago. <coughs> I guess you could say it's sad for such a little girl to be waiting around for her father to come home, but still. The girl now sleeps in the corner of a communal storehouse run by the people at the marketplace. We all used to talk about taking care of her and to be standing parents until for her until the father comes back. This is no surprise to Kaim. He knows from his own experience that all the people who work in the marketplace, and not just this plump, kindly woman, are good hearted and generous despite their limited means. Otherwise, they never would have hired a stranger like himself. But long before that first six months went by, we were heartily sick of her. She was a sweet, simple girl walked the mother's alive, but this experience has left her kind of twisted. All her sweetness is gone. Of course, we all feel sorry for her, and we take our turns feeding her and dressing her and hand-me-downs, but the way she keeps telling lies to all the grown-ups, nobody really cares about her anymore. Why can't she see that? She must be lonely, don't you think? With a pained smile, the woman shrugs and says, it's enough gapping for one day. Work, work. And she goes back inside the shop. <coughs> Kaim is sorting the vegetables he's unloaded in front of the shop when he hears a little voice behind him. Hi, miss, are you new here? It's the girl. Uh-huh. You're not from this town, are you? No, I'm not. Are you living upstairs where you work here? For a while, at least. That's what I'm hoping to do. I'll tell you a secret, okay? It's starting already. Okay, Kaim says without pausing his work. There's a ghost in this marketplace. People here don't tell anybody about it because it's bad for business. But it's really here. I see it all the time. Really? Kaim responds with a faint surprise. He decides to play along with her rather than scold her for lying. In this endlessly, living, endlessly long life of his, he's encountered any number of children who have lost their parents or been abandoned by them. The sadness and loneliness of children who have been cast into the wide world alone are exactly what Kaim feels himself as he continues to wander through the infinite flow of time. <coughs> what kind of ghost? <coughs> a woman, and I know who she is. It's the ghost of a mother who lost her child, she says. Her little girl, her only child, died in an epidemic. Overcome with grief, the mother chose to die, and now her ghost appears in the market every night, searching for her daughter. The poor mother. She killed herself so she could be with her daughter, but she can't find her in the other world either. <coughs> she keeps looking for her here and calling out, Where are you? Hurry and come with mommy to the other world. The girl tells her story with deadly seriousness. Don't you think it's sad? She asks Kaim. She actually has tears in her eyes, which is precisely why Kaim knows she is lying. Even if he had not been warned by the woman, he would know this was a lie based on what she told him about the girl's background. Kaim carefully arranges bunches of well ripened grapes in the display crate and asks the girl, Why do you think the mother can't find her daughter? What? The girl asks him with a dazed stare. Well, he explains the girl is not in the other world, and she's not wandering around in this world. So where is she? <coughs> Kaim does not mean this to be a cross-examination. He simply feels that someone who lies out of sorrow can have a far easier time of it by recognizing a lie for what it is. The loneliness of the girl who has lost her mother and been abandoned by her father consists not in telling one lie, but in having to keep on lying. Hmm, I think mentioned it. That's a good point. The girl says, smiling calmly. Really, where did that girl go? Kai momentarily considers pointing at the girl and says to stay right here. But before he can do so, she continues. 
This is the first time anybody ever asked me that. You're kind of different, I wonder. No, you are. You're different, the girl insists. <coughs> I think we can be friends, her smile deepens. Kind of smiles back at her, saying nothing. Just then they hear the lady green grocer coming from the back of the shop and the girl dashes away. Just before she disappears around the corner in the alleyway, the girl gives Kaim a little wave as to say, See you soon. For the first time, the face of the girl with an all too grown up sp speaking style shows a hint of childishness befitting her years. The girl begins coming to see Kaim at the shop several times a day when the lady grocer is not around. She tells him one lie after another. <coughs> I bet cookies with my mother last night. I wanted to give you some, but they were so good I ate them all. Bandits kidnapped me while I was a little baby, but my father came to save me and beat up all the bandits so I didn't get killed. My house? It's a big white one at the foot of the mountain. You're in here, so you probably don't know it. It's the biggest house in town. <laughs> you don't have a family? You're all alone? Poor Kaim. I wish I could share some of my happiness with you. <coughs> all of her lies are born of sorrow. Sad, lonely lies. She can never tell the mark of those people in her background. In the end of every chat with Kaim, as she's leaving, the girl holds her finger to her lips and says, Shh, there's a little secret. Don't tell the lady grocer. Of course, Kaim says nothing to anyone. If he happens to find himself in a situation where the market people are speaking ill, the girl quietly slips away. <coughs> Lies and disparagement are funny things. They don't take shape because someone tells them, but rather because someone listens to and voices agreement with them. A truly isolated individual can never speak ill of anyone. The same can be said regardless of lies. Because she has told some someone to tell her lies to, the girl need not fall into the abyss of true isolation. To protect her small, sad share of happiness, Kaim plays the role of her listener, raising no objections. One day when the girl comes to see Kaim, she takes special care not to be noticed by the lady grocer or by the owners of the neighboring shops. Tell me, mister, are you planning to stay here a long, long time? No, I'm not, Kaim says, continuing to unload vegetables and fruit. You'll be leaving when you save up enough money? Probably. But you don't have enough yet? I'm getting there, he says, turning a strained smile on the girl. This is a white lie of his own. He already has enough money to support himself on the road. Nor has he taken his current living job because he needs money so badly. He is here because he has not found a destination he wants to travel to. A journey without a destination is an endless journey. Wise men say you need dreams and goals in life, but dreams to accomplish and goals to realize shine as guideposts in life precisely because life is finite. So then, what should be the dreams and goals of one who is unburdened with a life that has no end? Time is not a journey to be hurried. Nor is it one that can be hurried. Perhaps drifting day after day with no destination cannot even be called a journey. If I were you, says the girl, I would get out of this marketplace as soon as I had saved up the money for two or three days of traveling. Kaim responds to her with a silent, pained smile. What would be the look on the girl's face if Kaim were to tell her, I'm staying here for you? I'm finding the meaning of my life for now and providing you with a listener for your lies. The moment these words come to mind, words he can never actually speak to her, the girl looks around furtively and says in an air whisper, if you want to get out of here soon, I know a good way you can do it. <coughs> a good way? Sneak in the tailors and steal his money. This little pot in the cabinet at the back of the shop, it's full of money. <coughs> Are you telling me to steal it? Yes. She looks straight at Kaim without a slightest show of doubt in her eyes. In all seriousness, she goes on to explain the tailor deserves to have his place robbed. The money in the pot, she says, is tainted. I know this girl, a good friend of mine, she says, and it's so sad about her. Her mother died, and her friend... Her father went off to work in the capital, and she's all alone. Her father was supposed to come and get her after six months, but she hasn't heard a thing from him. Yet another lie born of sorrow. <coughs> Kaim calmly asks, is there some connection between your friend and the tailor? Of course, she says, a close connection. What's really happening is the father was sending her money every month the way he was supposed to, to help make her life in the town a little easier. And he kept writing to her. He wanted to tell her he found a good job in the city, and she should come live with him right away. He's too busy to come for her, so she should come to him. And he sent her money for the tip trip, but none of the letters of the money ever reached the girl. And why do you think that is? Before him time can answer, the girl says, The mistake he made was to send the letters of money care of the tailor. He's been keeping all the money for himself. Kaim looks away from the girl. In order to prop up one sad lie, the girl is piled on a still sadder one. A lie that can hurt another person. This is the saddest thing of all. The lock on the tailor's back door would be really easy to break, the girl adds, and she gallops away without waiting for Kaim's reply. The girl comes running in the grocery store the next morning, shouting for the owner. She says directly to the woman, not to Kaim. Burglars broke into the tailor's shop last night. She says she saw a number of burglars sneaking in late at night after the market was emptied out. <coughs> my oh my, says the woman with a forced smile. That must have been just terrible. She's obviously not taking the girl seriously. 
But it's true, though. I really saw them. Look, little girl. I've had just about all I can take from you. You're such a little liar. It scares me to death to think about you growing up to be a burglar or a con artist or something. I'm busy trying to open my shop now. Do you mind? Try it on somebody else. <laughs> She's hardly through speaking when someone outside shouts, Help! Somebody come! The trailer... Taylor is standing in the street, looking horrified and screaming at the top of his lungs. But burglars, they took all my, my, my money! The little girl slips away as the tailor comes in. <coughs> the marketplace is in an uproar. The girl is not lying, that much is certain. But all too accustomed to her lies, people now suggest the possibility of another kind of lie. Maybe she did it. What do you think? And so it begins. I think you may be right. Talk about play acting. I wouldn't put it past her. Let's go find her. We'll make her tell. Even if we have to get a little rough with her. No one objects to the suggestion. Some run off in the storehouse and others start searching the marketplace. Can't find her anywhere. The storehouse is empty. She ran away with the money. As the searchers return with the reports and speculation, Kaim under finally understands everything. After all her sad lies, the girl has left behind one final truth. She couldn't have gotten very far. Yeah, we can still catch her. The little thief waits till I get my hands on her. The men rage and the women fan the flames. Good. Give her what she deserves. We were so nice to her, now look how she shoots us. We can't let her get away with it. A dozen men start to run after her. But Kime stands tall on the rope, blocking their way. <laughs> hey, move it. They run her off her blood, and Kime knows if he felt like he could knock them all down, they wouldn't be able to <coughs> lay a finger on him. Instead, he relaxes a powerful stance and throws a leather coin pouch on the ground in front of the men. The stolen money is in there, he says. What? Sorry, I stole it. Confused stir quickly turns into angry shouts. Kamala raises his hands to show he will not resist. Do what you like with me, I'm ready. Lady Grocery breaks through the wall of men, shouting him, How could you do this, Kaim? I wanted the money, that's all. And you're not just saying this to protect the girl? This woman's intuition is too sharp. Forcing a smile, Kaim turns to Taylor and says, It was in the pot in the cabinet, right? The man nods energetically. It's true, he must have done it. I had the money in a pot. He's the thief. <coughs> the money wasn't the only thing in the pot, though. Was it? What are you saying? You had some letters in there, too. Letters from the girl's father. That's a lie. Don't be crazy. It's true, though. No, there couldn't have been any letters. I threw them out. The tailor clasped his hand in his mouth, but it's too late. <coughs> the lady grocery grabs him. What's this all about? She demands. Uh, no, I mean, you better tell us everything. People's angry glances turn from Kime to the tailor. Some days later, two letters arrive from the girl addressed to the lady of the grocery store and the nice man upstairs. Kime's letter says the girl managed to find her father in the capital. He has no way of knowing this is true or not. It's hard to imagine the girl finding her father in the big city so easily without knowing his address or workplace. Still, he decides to believe it. <laughs> and the girl's letter says, I'm happy now. Human beings are the only animals that lie. Lies to deceive people, lies to benefit oneself, and lies to protect one's own heart from the threat of crushing loneliness and sorrow. There were no lies in the world. Much strife and misunderstanding would surely disappear. On the other hand, perhaps it's because this world is a mixture of truth and lies that people have learned how to believe. When he is through reading his letter, Kime turns to the woman. Concentrating on her own letter, she shyly raises her head when she senses Kime looking at her. I give up, she declares. Listen to this. I'm so grateful for you and the others at the marketplace for all you've done for me. I'll never forget you as long as you live. A lie to the bitter end, that girl, she says, smiling through her tears. It's so sad. <coughs> Alright, we gotta figure out where the fuck to go in this game. Let's see. Lost Odyssey. Oh, what an <laughs> lame ass. 
Okay, well, we know where to go now. So that's good. Factory of Ura. Is all because we did. We went one direction instead of another. And, like, this seems kind of, like, silly to me. Like, you can be wandering around in this area, in this town, talk, you talk to every single person. <coughs> if you don't walk back to this park. I not already go in here? I could have swore I went in here already. You know what? It. I wonder if I didn't save it properly. Yep, because the carriage is there. Shit! All of that. And I'm just. I'm an idiot. All of that, and I'm an idiot. House arrest is going too far. I have firmly opposed Roxian on this. Do not despair, Gongora. Thank you, Your Majesty. I could. I do. Guess I gotta do this. I'm truly happy that you have come to see me. You've always been so kind. You... I can't... Last time, so I missed this part. Boo. But you please let me know what you need, Gongora. I can help you. Oh, yep. Yeah, I know. He keeps kneeling. Got it, got it, got it. So silly. Skip. Um, there was nothing in that direction. That I'm pretty certain. Let's see, there's a tank. <coughs> there's some chest to out here. Yeah, I remember, God, I remember there being like a shit ton of stuff out here. Flare bomb, Berserker necklace. him with Gush's power or the Hawkeye. Uh, actually, I think I want to get the Berserker necklace. <coughs> So now we should be going back out and hopefully no more issues. Leave. Okay, 
save. So now it's actually safe. Cutscene you're looking for. Was Seth. Hey, I've been looking everywhere for you. I heard about the Grand Staff investigation. Looks like we both got the short end of the stick. It's not enough that we just keep surviving, eh? <sighs> There's always something. So, what did you learn in the council? Nothing to do with you. Oh, <laughs> really? Say, haven't we met somewhere before? Hmm? Ugh. Nothing to worry about if you can't remember. Neither can I. You too, huh? <laughs> I can't recall a thing. All I know is that my name seems to be Seth Balmore. <sighs> People say I used to be a pirate. <sighs> Isn't it strange that both of us lost our memory and are immortal? <laughs> Maybe we met a long time ago. I sort of get that feeling when I look at you. Hmm. When we met before, were we enemies? Or allies? Or maybe even... Lovers? <laughs> Looking forward to starting our journey tomorrow, Kaim Argonar. Tomorrow? You still haven't been contacted by the Council? You set out for Grand Staff tomorrow morning. I thought you would have heard by now. Oh, and by the way, I'll be joining you on your little trip. So you are going with me then? Being late is strictly forbidden. <clears throat> Welcome back. I received a message from the council earlier. You report to the Grand Gate. Great Gate for your next mission. If you head to the station, you can either take the monorail or pick up a taxi at the Great Gate. Be careful out there. Okay, well. I'm just leaving now, I guess. Um, I'm assuming this guy's still not in here. <sighs> Boo, Barkus. Barkus sucked. Ooh, Main Street. And we have all the makings of a bunch of rings, but no actual rings. This is a place to catch magic taxi. Where are you headed? The Great Gate. Great Gate, yes please, get in. Great get of bro. Why aren't we leaving? We should have already been gone by now. I'm waiting for somebody. What? Who? There's somebody else on the team. Huh? I haven't heard about that. I have. Jensen. What the? This is the other guy? 
15 for her, for her, and her. That's 45 minutes. Good. That's all I'm Like we would wait for you, you worthless drunk. That hurt. You poor nice. things. I think you know what? Good. You're free to go. Hey, hey. Thanks oh. for bringing him to us. Oh. 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 Well, well, thank you. Oh. You're such a doll. You come and play with us next time, honey. Hey, there. don't touch me. Get out of here. Shoot! Oh, that's not very nice. Okay, bye-bye, girl. Don't cry. I'll be back. Don't worry. Okay, bye again. Great. Just what we need. More useless hey, baggage. Hey, hey, that's not nice. I ain't gonna come in real handy. You know, you can count on it. Oh, hey. Who's counting on what? Ow. Hey. Man. You are so angry. What is your problem? Hey, uh, you ready? You've been ready, bro. View the skill link tutorial. Mortals like Jansen learn new skills every single level, but mortals don't require new skills to leveling up. Mortals can learn skills from mortals using skill link. Configure skill link to the next skill menu. By selecting a mortal, all the skills learned are displayed. Select the skill to learn, and a link will be established. Lure stream is for the SP gauge. SP can be gained in battle. An immortal using skill link with a mortal can only earn SP towards the link skill they're both in formation. If using skill link, don't forget to set the battle formation. Skills can also be learned from accessories. Some accessories grant the user the skill effects with skills and provide equipping them. Skills learned from mortals will not be affected until you assign them in skill slots. Seth, uh, the bruiser ring, and a holy knight charm. Uh, and then let's equip Jansen with Hawkeye. And let's do skill link. Jansen, let's learn steel. Running to me, I've got some new wares in stock. Let's take a look what I have to offer. Beyond the Great Gate is a dangerous region, infested with monsters. You best be prepared for traveling through there. From equipment to medicine, I've got everything you need. Oh shit, yeah, let's get some medicine.
probably should have got some antidotes, but I have two. Okay, let's come here quick. Oh, let's see. I gotta go. Unfortunately, out of time. I don't want to check to see if there's any items up here. Looks like there's an item. Fighting in, see, see some more of the game. Um, obviously, you know, it's kind of been just like slugging along, but. But you could bug, I just gotta fall on. This is like a death march. Hey, we gotta get through that? Uh, got about maybe there's no road! Pull yourself together. Minutes. If this is all it Throw takes to wear you here. out, we're in trouble. Yeah, well, I don't wear out in bed. Once we get through here, there's the Ypsilon Range. Those mountains are steep and rugged. The weather is unpredictable. And since the ground is unstable, we have to be on the lookout for rock slides, too. Of course, I expect to see you take a tumble into the canyon before we see any rocks doing it. <laughs> yeah, funny. You know, Lord Gungora was saying you have a problem with your memory, right? I mean, you sure know these mountains well enough. And of course, you know you shave your legs every day and you pluck your eyebrows and you owe me money. So, I, I'm confused. You sure you really don't remember my body remembers. What? There was a time when I used to rush through here. I was a pirate, and supposedly I also went through these mountains. But I just don't know what the truth is. I don't have any answers. Huh. Well, what about you? Did anyone tell you what you once were? No. Nothing? Nothing. Well, since you're so upbeat and happy, I doubt if anyone will remember you. That's fine with me. Oh? My body also remembers. How so? Just that it was painful. If I happen to remember, and my past didn't amount to much. And I think it's probably better to have never remembered. It's true. Oh yeah, that's smart. Hashtag never remember. Kind. There's no need to rush it. Never remember. Your memories will come back gradually. And they're not all bad. Hmm. What? No breaks? You just had one. Yeah, how about some water? A little fruit? How about a foot massage? My feet don't stink. Kaim, you up for that? Hello? I think your feet sink, man. That's just neat. Alright. Let's see what we got here. Oh, okay. Did jump right in? Did I, I bought some help items. I don't care about help items. So the enemy's got a formation going. Formation in front row provides a defensive wall for the back row, so any damage to the enemy the back row is uh, so he's in the front. Oh, well, he can only do on the back. He can only attack in the front. Oh, apparently we're just... You can see how tight the front row's defense is with this. Guard condition. <coughs> Gage in the upper left-hand corner of the screen begins the enemy 
Alice Car Condition. The gauge is up right and it gets Alice Car Condition. Car Condition is made up of total HP in the front row. By attacking the enemies in the front row, you can reach the Car Condition to the right. Get rid of the enemies in the front row and the back row start losing the defense. Not bad at all. See the guard conditions going down. The higher the guard condition, the less damage you can cause the enemies in the back row. When the guard condition reaches zero, and you have to be numbers of your moves. I'll be in the back scrapping while I'm going Gotta like be on top of it. Man. Look, now they're casting a spell. Here's a little hint for you to see the action over in this play on the bottom that I'm covering up. Well, you punched the guy who was trying to cast a spell, right? Me up, I guess. <coughs> that intended <coughs> extending the amount of time he needs to pull a spell off, so casting interference. If you manage to cause enough interference, you can keep the spell from popping off till the next turn. Well, enough talk. I'd still take care of this rap. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Give one of those to Jansen. Um, I don't think I have wind damage. I'll put the wind ring on. Oh, he has wind. Okay, so wind, wind is a good thing for him to figure out. So set up that way. Kind of hugged this other way going on here, but I didn't see if there's anything over here worthwhile. We hugged the right hand side. It doesn't look like there's anything new, fortunately. Thank you. 
Alright, we learned some stuff. Let's go ahead and head back to the save point. Um, unfortunately, I have to stop by. No, I said like 20 minutes, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be cut short. So I was say I was hoping I made it back here without having to do a thing, but we'll add this on to the last video. So thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it, and I will see you all next time. Bye. All right, let's grind a little bit. Let's grind. So these ones, oh, prism is all I need. Okay, so you can do different things. Okay, that's kind of cool. <sighs> Perfect. Jansen's next is at a hundred out. Settler and steel. Okay, let's get that. Let's set steel here. She knows white magic now. Let's learn black magic. Time knows light magic now, so let's learn black magic. I see we get more slots later on. <laughs> Hopefully. This is where we were at earlier. We had to run back and save a slot seat. Slot seed grants an extra skill slot to an immortal. Okay, well, let's look at the stats. Let's see who has better magic attack. Seth has better magic attack, so we want her to have more magic slots. I think. Still steal for now. Ram. <coughs> so I wonder if you can turn those seeds into skill slot seeds. Can we trade them for something? Yo, I have two items back here. Two antidotes. Oh, it's good to have. A knight's code. What does knight's code do for me? Equip. Who covers GC and using defend while being attacked? That's pretty cool. Put that on, I guess. Yeah. 
guess we can do the bruiser. Um, Some more beast horns.
too so I guess. Already. What do you want? Ah, uh, whining. Okay. Is that all you can say? Can't we just rest in that hut over there? All you do is complain, complain, complain. I'm not like you, <coughs> you. I'm a normal human being. What should we do? <coughs> Thank you. I see, I see the thing. It's there, isn't it? No? I guess more there's a secret there. Let's pick it up.
very fun. Ypsilon Mountains, Mountain Hut. Power drink? Oh, let's see what that does. Oh, it does increase your power during battle. Defense drink? Antidote. So hopeful. Status analysis. He's almost on Knight's Code. A seed obtained. Let's see what's upstairs. Finally reached the mountain hut. Everyone was worn out. I can barely keep my eyes open long enough to leave these for a few words. We we're staying in this hut for a while. A giant monster inhabiting the Ypsilon has appeared. We only glimpsed the shadow near the peak, but it was enough to make us think twice about going on. We got a light fever, probably from the rain during the climb. The weather changes so fast up here. I still have my appetite, but I've taken some medicine too. I should be fine after I'm rested. The keeper of these mountains is still in the prowl near the summit. We hear the beat of its giant wings and roars periodically. We should be safe in this hut, but who knows when we'll be able to leave. I thought the Epsilon Mountains were a terrifying place, a nest of monsters, but everything is so beautiful up here. We discovered an exquisitely rare flower today. There isn't much else to do right now. The mass of the Epsilon Mountains finally seems to have moved on. At least we can leave this place. We're going to ensure our safety tomorrow and depart. Rest. Rest. Shield obtained. So pretty solid and everything. <coughs> hey, there's a bed here. Let's stay here. Uh, sure, let's rest. Well, no. Let us rest. Listen, if either Kaim or Seth seem like they're starting to regain even a fragment of their memories, use this. Hold on, I want to see something real quick. And I, that's the reason, but could be. I mean, it's not choppy now. Uh, oh, Seems hi. Better. I couldn't sleep. I'm usually exercising, you know, sparring with people, and that'd be, I work out a lot before I. Was that all? W was what? What all? About what? You know I mean, what I mean. Yeah. Well, no, I don't. 
know what you mean. What do you mean? Since 3240, there's no way I've only played this game for... Is that supposed to be 32 hours? Let's go back and check this. I want to save again. What is that? Because see, 248... That's 32 hours? Is it because I'm putting it in sleep mode? But why would this one be 248 and be the most? Right? Oh, uh, that, because that's the one that... I, yep, 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 yep. That was my old save. Um, can I, the real question is, can I rest again? I can rest again. So I should grind at least one more level, I think. attack boost. Learned everything from Seth, so we're good. Um, but I think Seth can equip a different, yeah, search glasses. Uh, 
that I thought I was gonna do that because I forgot that I was the lowest out. That's a waste of time. This is really hard to hard to do that. Right. I think one more battle, I think we probably got it, right? Yeah, maybe not. Let's see, so that 36. So let's see how much experience points we're getting from these guys. Resolution seems to have done pretty well. It's a little jittery, but it's not like crazy bad like it was.
don't need to dream tonight. Would you like to save? Yes. Would love to save. Um, Alright, let's go with this one down here. Because this makes no sense. Our time in this game is going to be ridiculous because I've only played like five out of Maybe like four hours, three hours. And I'm at, it says 3250, which is dumb, but whatever. Um, so, alright, thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.